Welcome to Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast. My name is Stephanie Vlakis, and I'm an expert certified fertility dietitian and nutritionist and founder of The Dietologist, a multiple award winning virtual fertility and pregnancy nutrition clinic serving thousands from around the world, and of course, the host of this pod, Fertility Friendly Food. This podcast is dedicated to all things health and nutrition in the world of fertility, reproductive health, and pregnancy. Each week, I bring you practical snack size episodes to help improve your lifestyle on your trying to conceive journey, alongside guest expert interviews to help inspire you to learn and grow whilst you grow your family. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast. This week, I am excited to invite a very special guest on to discuss donor conception, donor eggs, donor sperm, donor embryos. We see many people in our virtual clinic here at the Dietologist rely on the generosity of both known to you, known and unknown donors to create families for a variety of reasons, spanning from single mums by choice using donor sperm, donor sperm used in reciprocal IVF in female same-sex couples, donor eggs and gestational surrogates for male same-sex couples, men with male factor infertility that can't be overcome with medical interventions, diet or lifestyle, for example, Klinefelter syndrome or some cancer cases, or increasingly we are seeing females who have reached menopause early or who are trying to conceive with poor quality eggs due to age, cancer treatment, significant endometriosis, and are making the decision to grow their family with the help of a donor egg. Now, I know from working with people that this moment where a doctor mentions the word donor can feel earth shattering. And so I wanted to get an expert on to talk us through some of the key questions, thoughts, concerns, and just kind of scrape the surface. It is a very detailed episode and it's quite long. It's longer than our usual episodes, but I think it's really an important one. And we were very lucky to have Maida Getman, who is a fertility coach who has a special interest in donor conception and is a mother herself to twin girls who were conceived with the help of a donor after her own infertility journey. So I won't do a community question this week just for the sake of time, but don't forget you can leave us a question with the link in the show note below anytime to have it answered on the podcast. And if you are thinking about donor conception or you know someone who is or you think someone could be your donor or you're considering becoming a donor yourself, then listen in. And even if you're not, if you're just curious to learn more, then this is a must listen episode. So welcome to Nada to Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast. So excited to have you here to talk about all things donor conception. So tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do so our listeners can get to know you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I am So excited to be here. So I'm a fellow fertility warrior. My husband and I went through seven rounds of fertility treatments um, using my own eggs before we were told that we were going to need to use donor eggs in order to have our children. So we did one round of IVF with donor eggs, and we are blessed to have twin girls from that cycle. I'm also a fertility coach who supports families who are really making the tough decision. They're really at this crossroads of whether or not they're going to pursue an alternative path to becoming a parent, ideally if they're considering donor conception. So I work with them on figuring out if that's the right option for them, and then if it is, how to really navigate navigate that path forward for them. Yeah. yeah, incredible work that you do. We were just having a brief chat before we hit record about some of the nuances of donor conception and how common it is that even in our virtual clinic that we see people requiring a donor for all sorts of different circumstances. So some circumstances require donor eggs, donor sperm, or donor embryos, which may be an option for both individuals or couples on a part to grow their family. But I would just love to hear from you as someone who works in this space day in and day out in donor conception. What are the most common scenarios that lead people to donor conception as an option? 
You know, there's so many people out there who are using a donor to conceive, and there's so many different reasons why people are pursuing donor. So the ones that are fairly common and that we see a lot are same-sex couples, people who are doing reciprocal IVF, right? Because their partnership, they don't have the two kinds of gametes that we need in order to create a baby, right? We might have two people with sperm, two people with eggs. But then there's also a whole nother population of people who maybe have medical conditions that are causing them to struggle. So medical conditions such as azoospermia, where a man doesn't have sperm, he's not producing sperm. There's genetic disorders such as Turner syndrome. So some of those folks might know early on that it might be hard for them to conceive or that they won't be able to conceive. There are people who have maybe unfortunately gone through cancer treatments and those treatments have impacted their eggs or their sperm, making it impossible for them to use those gametes later on in life. And because of the timing or because the research or whatever, they didn't have an option to do any freezing. So they may need to use a donor. And then there's also people like me who have diminished ovarian reserve, people who are maybe going through premature menopause, and so they can't use their eggs. People are pursuing families later in life. We know that as we get older, our eggs start to become less high quality. And for some people, they're choosing not to explore being a parent until they're into their 40s. And so they just don't have as many eggs available. So there are a lot of reasons why people pursue donor. I think it's just great there that donor is an option because there are so many of us who may end up needing a donor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other group that we see a lot of is, well, for us, we see a lot of single moms by yes. choice as well. Yes. You require donor sperm. Obviously, there's lots of other ways to become a, a parent without a partner, but classically, we see a lot of females who are hoping to become pregnant and carry a pregnancy with donor sperm. Question for you, Maida, what is the difference between a known and an unknown donor? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I like to actually think about it in three ways, known to you donor, known donor, and unknown donor. So a known to you donor is a donor that you know, they're in your life, they're a friend, they're a family member, they're someone that you already have a relationship with. A known donor is someone who you pursue through an agency or through a bank or something like that, but you have access to that person. Maybe you're allowed to meet them. Maybe you have their contact information, but you have access to that person. You know their name, you know how to find them. And then there's unknown donor, which is someone who you typically would find through a bank or clinic or an agency where you know things about them, but you don't know any identifying information about them. So you don't know their name, you don't know where they live, you have no way of contacting them. So that's kind of how I differentiate the three different types of donor. Yeah, I love the known to you and the known differentiation mm -hmm. because I think if you've never entered, thought about donor conception at all, everyone has a different idea of what the relationship to a donor would look like. And I think that creates a lot of fear and anxiety and that uncertainty. So I think knowing that you have potentially a few different options to consider is an important element because I think a lot of people do feel worried about how much connection they or their future children would have with their donor. Yeah, and I think it's also really important to call out that nowadays, unknown donor is basically impossible. So mm. you might not know who this person is as you are pursuing the donation or you're pursuing, you know, having access mm. to that person's gametes, let's say. However, with the way that our world has changed, with consumer DNA and genetic testing, such as Ancestry.com, 23andMe, these everyone knows about these places, it's really easy to figure out who someone is based off of a really basic cheek swab. And I think the other thing that's important to know is just because you don't do a cheek swab or the donor doesn't do a cheek swab 
doesn't mean there isn't a connection. So like if your let's just say your donor doesn't do a cheek swab, but their uncle does. If you do a cheek swab and send it in, the uncle's going to connect. And now it may take you more time to figure it out, but there is that connection. So it's really in the world today and how the world works, unknown can be unknown for a period of time, but it's not going to be unknown forever. And it's important people know that. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, if you really want to know something in this day and age between the internet and like what you said, just the accessibility to cheap genetic testing, like Ancestry.com is not expensive anymore. It is not. cheap. No. Well, and they run sales. Like you can get it for like $50 or less. Like it's not expensive. No. And so I think just with the increased accessibility and the natural curiosity that people tend to have just about who they are and where they've come from, that may have nothing to do with IVF or donor conception or anything at all, just like in general, it's just so incredibly common. I can imagine that people have those dots joined up for sure. I think that's a really important caveat with the unknown donor component. Yes. So in Australia, donor sperm, donor eggs, donor embryos, all of those donations are altruistic. There's no form of like compensation for that donation. Like the costs of the medical procedures typically are covered if it's for the clinic or if it's for somebody, then that's covered. But, and that's similar for gestational surrogacy as well. I understand that that's different for each country, but for those who perhaps are considering approaching a family member or a friend or somebody in their life to request them to become a known to you donor, what, like, I mean, this is probably a whole, whole like episode in and of itself, but what kind of tidbits could you give people? Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent, that's a whole podcast episode, but a couple things. One, I think a known to you donor is a beautiful thing. It's amazing. And not everyone has the option to have someone that they could even consider or think about. So if you do have someone that you're considering, that is beautiful. And I think it's, it's really cool. And I think sometimes people jump to other options and they don't think about people in their life who might be able to be a donor. It's a beautiful thing because I believe and work with my clients and everyone that I talk to that having access to and knowing who your donor is, is so key and important for the health and development and normalcy of donor conception for your child and for your family. So if you're pursuing this option, having the ability to be in touch with and contact the donor is huge. So using a known to you donor is amazing because you would already have that relationship. You would already have that connection. There's so much you would already know about them. But I think the things that are really important to consider if you are planning to approach a family member or friend is one that you know that you can be really open and honest with this person. You are going to be having a lot of difficult conversations, uncomfortable conversations, challenging conversations, thinking through the future when we don't know what the future is going to look like, being willing to being open to changing our minds and having conversations about that. And so you need to make sure that you're comfortable now having those conversations with that person, because if you choose to use them and they say yes, you're going to continue those conversations. I think the second part is being really open with them about your journey to becoming a parent. Why are you at this point? Why are you pursuing this as an option? Now, if you're pursuing it because you're in a same-sex relationship or you're a single mom by choice or, you know, some of those reasons that you need gametes, That's different, but I think it's also really important just that they know why do you want to be a parent? What is this dream of yours that they might play a huge role in helping you achieve? So I think bringing them along in your story, bringing them along in your journey helps to build that relationship with them. And then I think it's important as you're talking to them is all the things you have to think about. How are you going to talk to your child about it? How's the relationships going to be? Who's going to tell? Who do you want to know? Thinking through all of those things is important. And then the last piece of it that is so important is just the legal contracts and all the things that you have to do in order to make it happen. I hear people say, oh, but it's my sister and I trust her 100% and we don't need this. 
you a thousand percent need it. You need it for you. You need it for them and you need it for your child. So, but I think it's just the initial approach is really just sharing with them your story, what's going on and asking. And then I think the last thing is giving them the space and time to consider it because it's a life-changing decision for them and it's a life-changing decision for you. And if they say no, being willing to respect their decision so that you can continue in the relationship with them. It's a lot to consider, but I do think it is a really beautiful thing to consider someone and ask someone to do that for you. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to be part of somebody's story in all angles with the gestational surrogate. So in the creation of the embryo the car- like the preparation for a transfer, following someone into gestational surrogacy and delivery and then induction of lactation. And it is like every time it just always moves me, like that family is incredible. I just love it. And I just, like it's so beautiful in so many ways and I adore the whole process of it. I don't adore what ha- had to happen to get to that point, but I think what can come from it can be so beautiful and can galvanize a lot of relationships for the positive as well. And I do find personally, I'm not sure if if you find the same with a lot of clients, is that a lot of people offer to be a donor to somebody who they know is going through a tough time with their fertility. And I think that is one of the key benefits of being really open about your journey to your nearest and dearest because, yeah, sometimes people can just offer that to you and what a beautiful gift and that can take some of that build up and anxiety of approaching someone to ask them away from it of course it doesn't take all the those next questions and counseling and legalities from it but I think working up to that ask can feel like the biggest question in the world it's like a proposal isn't it like it's like gotta get the lights gotta get the ring gotta get the (laughs) we gotta get everything it's a big deal yeah I think that's one of the key benefits that I see amongst our clients of being you know open to the people around them about what they're going through it makes such a difference to that approach or people offering 100%. And I think too, if you have a relationship with someone that you feel comfortable enough sharing your journey with and your path to becoming a parent with, like they are going to be in your life for a long time. And that's what like by choosing them or asking them to be your donor, they will be in your life for the rest of your life. And what an amazing opportunity, not just for you to be able to realize your dream of having a family, but for this, you know, dear family member or friend to be able to give you a gift and to be able to support you, like, it's incredible. And I love seeing it happen. So I actually adore it because I feel like watching on, you feel helpless, Mm -hmm. like watching someone go through IVF, like as a professional, it's different because I can actually help you with practical things. But as a human, it's hard to watch another human go through that and to be able to, as a family member or a friend or whatever, do something so practical and beautiful in giving that gift. It's just so cool. I love it. Anyway, I could like talk about it forever. Let's move on. In the case of those considering using eggs or sperm from an egg or sperm bank, for example, what do people typically get to know about their donor? So it really depends on the bank. Now, most banks have kind of the general level basic information about a person. So they're going to have their physical traits, like right, their hair color, their eye color, their skin tone, their height, their weight. A lot of them will have adult photos. Some will have adult and baby photos. So you can see kind of what the donor looked like and you can understand like their facial structure and facial features and body type and all that good stuff. A lot of banks will also give you like their highest education education level, they'll give you hobbies, interests, things that the person might be really good at. They give you ethnicity, race, religion. Some will go as deep as like if they speak different languages or if they play musical instruments or things like that. 
you'll get basic medical history for the donor. And then typically you will get medical history for two generations down. So you'll get the donor's medical history, you'll get their parents' medical history, and then grandparents' medical history. But it's really basic. The only thing they really tell you is, you know, like, grandmother passed away at 88 due to old age or something like that. It's not super detailed. They don't tell you like donor has dust allergies and gets migraines sometimes or whatever. And then depending on the bank, some will have them write out like answers to essay questions. Some will have them make videos. So it's really dependent on the bank. And I think it's important when you're looking for a donor at a bank that you go to the banks that have those elements of information that are important to you. Some of that information is not important to everyone. And so like if you don't care about a video or you it doesn't matter to you who they would invite, like what famous celebrity they'd invite to dinner, like then you don't need to go to that bank. Right. But if like those pieces of information are important to you, then you want to seek out a bank who actually provides those pieces of information. Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> <Would you? laughs> Why is that the universal trivia question of all time? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> or like, if you were an animal, what animal would you be? <laughs> but in all, like, in all seriousness, some of the answers to those questions can really help you get a sense of who this person is. Ultimately, and again, whole other podcast episode, but ultimately when it comes down to choosing your donor, I think all of those things that I listed off, that laundry list of things that you can know about someone are important. And they're things that we want to know. And so they aren't minimal or like, I don't minimize those things. But I also think when people are choosing a donor, especially through a bank, it comes down to how they feel about that person. And do they feel like I could be friends with you? I feel a connection to you in some way, shape or form, whether that's because your hair color is the exact same hair color as mine, or because I love dogs and hate cats and you love dogs and hate cats. And we, I feel there's some level of connection there. So it is important to kind of go through those things and think about like, do I feel like I could like this person or I like how they answered this question or no, I don't really like how they answered this question. No, it's so important. I think so many people consider the physical traits yes so much yeah which is yeah I mean if that's what's important to you that's important to you yeah totally and I think you know when my husband and I were going through this process and we were trying to figure out what kind of donor or who our donor was going to be and what we were looking for you know at first I was like okay what are all the things that I'm not so like I wish I was a collegiate athlete. I wish I could speak five languages. I wish I was taller. I wish I weighed less. Like, I wish I, you know, all these things. So I was like, yes, that's what we want for our donor, right? Like, more educated. And I full blown went with that. And then ultimately, what it came down to for me was I wanted someone who's just similar to me. Because I wanted to use my own eggs and I wasn't going to get to. And so like, yes, all of those other things are great. But ultimately, like, I just wanted someone who was going to be kind of like me. And I think that's what a lot of people want. It's what a lot of people want. And I think, but I think it's also okay to want someone who's maybe a little smarter than you. Like, yeah. stack the deck. If you can't, like, if you can't <laughs> use your own. Want, try to stack the deck. But I think when it comes down to it, that's ultimately what people want. That's what I wanted. And I think that's what mm. others want too. I mean, it, it makes sense because I think it's innate. I don't know what the right word is f- for what I'm about to say, but I think it's kind of innate that we want to see ourselves in our children in some way, whether that be physically, uh, personality, something. And so for one or both partners who may not no longer have that biological quote unquote tie, though that's questionable because epigenetics, but anyway, it's a story for a different day. The the genetic tie. Yep. The genetic tie, right? So that genetic tie, you know, is different now. And I think a lot of the selection then goes into trying to find these kinds of similarities, not only to the donor, but also 
for the sake of that connection to your child as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. What are some of the more practical, I mean, we've talked about a lot of practical things, but what are some of the practical considerations when it comes from a medical perspective? We briefly talked about things like family, medical history and future health of a potential child. Is there a lot of screening that is done of donors and are there a lot of conditions or like exclusions or is it quite inclusive and then it's a, it's up to you to select out? Like how much filtering is happening before they're even presented to you if you're using a bank or an agency, for example? So it's different for eggs and sperm. So it depends on if you're pursuing eggs versus sperm. There is some level of screening that's done. So... I'm more familiar with the egg donor screening, so I'll talk more about egg donor screening. But essentially, from an egg donor perspective, you go through a medical screening and they do run genetic testing on you. And they're looking for like the big, big genetic stuff. You know, they're not necessarily looking for every single genetic condition that could possibly be there, but they're looking for big ones and they're looking for specifically big ones that can be passed down or that if mixed with a certain other gene could then cause like a catastrophic issue, if you will. So there's that screening that they do. They also will do a full medical workup to make sure that the donor's healthy, that their hormone levels are right, that they're all, they don't have any medical conditions. And then they also go through a pretty extensive psychological screening, specifically like in the US, they'll go through a psychological questionnaire to make sure that like they are their mental health is solid and sound and that there aren't there isn't a family history of say like major mental health disorders or issues and so you know part of the screening process is it takes a while because it can take like two to three months because the donors also have to go through all of the testing and screening that we've had to go through as we've been going through our fertility treatment. So if you think about like, okay, I have to go in for my day three labs, like they have to go in for day three labs. So they also have to go through the timed appointments. And it's a big commitment to become a donor, uh, an egg donor specifically. Like you can't just say like, oh, I'm going to be an egg donor. And then like, you're good to go. You have to go through all of that screening. But here's the thing, like, just like with everything else, we only know the amount of information that we have today about someone. And it is based on an honesty system. So like, you know, the banks and stuff aren't, say, pulling the donor's medical records. So if the donor says, I don't have a history of colon cancer in my family, like they're not going to go pull all the medical records to confirm that they don't. Now, most of the people are doing it, especially in Australia. They're doing it for altruistic reasons. They are very honest. They're very kind. Like they're not going to go through this whole process just to be sneaky. So that's not how it works. But, you know, again, there will always be things that we don't totally know. And then once they're chosen as a donor, and then once there is, so like if you're using a fresh cycle, once they're chosen as a donor, then typically the other party will do some level of genetic testing and there'll be a screen to look at the donor's genetics up against, let's say the donor, the egg donor's genetics up against your partner's sperm or the person in the relationship who's donating, you know, who's contributing the sperm to make sure that there then isn't any major genetic you know, mutations or things that could happen. Yeah. Which is what we would recommend everyone to do preconception genetic carrier screening anyway. So it's just making sure that those things don't line up. That could be that one in four kind of inherited condition like cystic fibrosis or something like along those lines. Do you find that a lot of people are very concerned about the medical inheritability element of future health conditions for for a donor conceived child? Is that a big barrier that you find comes up or a concern? It's not a big barrier or something that comes up that's a concern. I think there are times where people, I see people choose like their perfect donor and then they do the genetic screening and then there are things that come up where it's up to you 
to decide, like, am I willing to take this risk or am I willing to manage this disease? So like, for example, my husband has hemochromatosis, which is a condition where you have excess amounts of iron in your system. He manages his condition fairly easily by donating blood. It's not a big deal. It doesn't really impact. I mean, it impacts his life because he has to have it monitored, but you know, it's not a huge life thing. Our donor was a carrier for hemochromatosis. So we we made the conscious decision that we were okay if our children had hemochromatosis because we knew it was a condition that was easily manageable and all of that good stuff. So there are times where you do have to make some of these decisions that you may not if you were just going and having sex with your partner and getting pregnant, like you would never think about these things. So I do see that come up. I think the other thing that I do that I see come up and in all honesty, didn't really think about this until I had my own children is all of the things that can come up that you don't know about and your donor doesn't know about and you're not faced with it until much further down the line. So this happened to me personally. My daughter was born with like a couple of the physical signs of a condition where, and the name is escaping me now because I haven't dealt with this in a while, but where your spinal cord doesn't fully detach from your tailbone. It's not a huge issue, but it's genetic and you want to have it taken care of. You can have it taken care of. It's pretty easy to take care of it, but you want to do it before they turn six, because once they turn six, you can have longer term, you know, side effects to the condition. And so we had been watching it, but we said we don't have any family history of it. There's no history on my husband's side. To our knowledge, there was no history on our donor's side. And All of a sudden, there became a huge history of it on my side of the family. Now, I'm not genetically connected to my children, but there's the conversation of epigenetics and all of this stuff. Thankfully, we have an amazing pediatrician who I was like, look, I don't know if there's a genetic issue here. I don't know because we don't know about the donor. Can we just have her screened for it? And we did, and we could, and she didn't have it, but... It's smaller things like that or things like, is our donor allergic to dust or is our donor allergic to pollen or when did she get her period for the first time? Like, I don't know this and I have girls. Now, I know when I got my period, but I don't know when my donor got her period. So, you know, just little things like that are things that I never thought about, but go back and circle back to that idea of knowing who your donor is and having access to them so that you could go and say like, hey, do you have a family history of this? Or, hey, when did you get your period? Right? Yeah. That is, you're not thinking of those things when you're trying to conceive a baby. You're just no. trying to conceive a baby. N- nor yeah. should you be, right? Like, you, mm. that's just too much. So anyway, all of that to say is, I see people giving genetics consideration, the big ones for sure. But the other ones, it's like, well, we're just going to navigate this as we, as best we can going forward. Yeah. And I mean, like some of that stuff happens if you knew that, you know, if you weren't, you know, some of the stuff just happens all the time. Allergies happen. No one's got an allergy. We don't know. It just happens sometimes. And it's that whole nature nurture, you know, lifelong conversation that we're always going to have is, you know, how much is environmental, how much is genetically you know, programmed within us from the get go and what triggers what and all that kind of stuff. It's tricky to tease all that out, but you're adding another party to that conversation. And so naturally the question is going to come up when things like what happened with your daughter arise of like, Mm -hmm. oh, is this a donor thing? Like, I don't know. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just important to know, like we're creating humans and there's so much about being human that we can't know and we can't control. And so we're making decisions like we're lucky to have the information we have. We can take that information and then we make the best decision we can make. But ultimately, the child that shows up, your child that shows up is going to be exactly who they are. And they're going to have hay fever and they might (laughs) have, you know, like they might have condition that needs to be fixed or whatever that is. 
that's part of life that happens to everyone, whether you use a donor or not. And that's then where you are transitioning from how your child was created to parenting your child. And that's your experience, whether you used a donor or not. So yeah, I was going to say that's parenthood. I was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I just, I think it's so important that sometimes we can get access to so much information that it becomes almost paralyzing and overwhelming. And we have to take a step back and go, okay, I have this information. What do I need in order to make the best decision? And then being confident in that decision, knowing that you'll figure it out as you go. And that's the best you can do because you can't control it. And you know that is part of infertility. You can't control it. You know, you know that as part of conception, you can't control everything. But knowing that and then moving forward is just how you have to do it. Accepting the uncertainty, I think, is one of the key skills that you have to build if you're going through any kind of fertility stuff. Totally. It's one of the hardest things, but it's truly the skill you need to really flex. Absolutely. I know many who are at the point of considering, particularly let's just use the example of donor eggs because dominantly the people that tune into our podcast are females. Many people grieve, including partners, are grieving that genetic link to their future child or future children. What advice do you have for those listening who are feeling this way, whether that be from a professional coach perspective or from your lived experience or a bit of both? Because I see personally in our clinic, this is probably the biggest barrier that we see. Yeah. So I think the key messages are, It is 100% normal to be grieving the loss of genetics. And a lot of times for a number of people, this is the first time they've really experienced true grief. A lot of people like have not had this like deeply rooted loss of what you thought building your family was going to look like. And the idea of and I think you mentioned it earlier, Stephanie, like the be- the ability to look at a child and to not see yourself in that child is gut-wrenching. It's devastating. And it is something that I work with my clients on every single day and I experienced it myself. So I can't answer the question without combining those two experiences because working with my clients is my lived experience too. I think the big things that I say to people are is one, really accepting the feelings that you're having and feeling those feelings, giving yourself the space to grieve that loss. You know, so often our reproductive endocrinologists are Their goal is to get us pregnant. And so when it's not working for us with our own eggs, let's say, or our husband's sperm, our doctors are like, okay, here's the next thing. Like, this isn't working. Here's the next thing. Let me know when you're ready. Like, let's go, let's go. Because like, I know you want to be pregnant and I want to get you pregnant and this is how it's going to work. And the reality is that hearing this news is loss. And so the only way to manage loss is with a little bit of time and is with being able to absorb the news and to go through those feelings of like, this is terrible. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I wish this wasn't this way. I'm really sad this is happening to me or happening to our family. And it's giving yourself the ability to process through that. And then I think it's starting to open your mind to new possibilities and new options. For most heterosexual couples who are going through infertility, they don't expect to hear donor is going to be the option for them. And so it's really just opening your mind to what does that even look like? Right. So I think even listening to this podcast episode is opening your mind to other possibilities, researching it. Come follow me on Instagram. Look up other donor conception, like people who have gone through it to understand. It doesn't mean you have to do it, it just means you're opening your mind to those possibilities. And then I think the last piece, and again, whole podcast episode on this, but I think it's 
just naming your feelings. It's just sitting down with your journal or a piece of paper or on your computer, however you process, and just writing it out because what those feeling, what that will do is it will bring those feelings to the surface and it's hard and it's scary to feel those feelings, but feeling them will help you start processing through this really tragic loss that you're experiencing because that's really what it is. And it's okay to say that. I think it's just okay to name it that and leave it as is, not to try to fix it or change it, but to just let it be. Thank you for that. I think that was so valuable and I found myself like nodding along to what you were saying because I had another conversation just yesterday with another podcast guest and the way that he talked about it was like mindsets and like you and your partner might be in a different mindset or or you might be in one mindset. You might be in we're going to make a baby and we're going to have sex and have a baby. <laughs> you think that that's how your family is going to be created. Then some time goes on and you start to come to terms with the next mindset, which means, hey, we might need some help. I don't know what that help looks like, but we may need some help. But if one of you is, is still here and the other is starting to encroach here, there's going to be a breakdown of communication. And then sometimes your doctor or your medical team are thinking the next two or three steps ahead, which is their job, mind you, like uh, like it's our job the same when we do fertility and nutrition. Like I have to think about this round not working. I have to think about this round working. I have to think about the next two rounds not working because I have to think three to six months in advance of what you're doing to make sure nutritionally we're doing all the things that are, are going to improve the chances and not jeopardise anything. So we're all doing it whether it's verbalized to you or not, <laughs> but you're in your own moment, right? And so I was saying to them that for many of the people that I see whose doctor does present, oh, maybe it's time to consider donor eggs. And it's quite casual to them because it's like their day, that this is their world, this is their industry, they're really comfortable with it. It almost, I, th- I think the way that I explained it is people take it as a personal offense or like a personal I don't know, like their doctors lost faith in their ability to conceive. Their eggs are no good. Their sperm is no good. Their embryos suck, whatever it is. I mean, I'm using very colloquial language here, but like, do you know what I mean? Like that's how they feel. They feel as though, oh, my doctor doesn't think I can do this. Like this sucks. Like, are we there yet? Like, I don't know if we're there. Like, I don't want to go there yet. Or there's this, it's grief. It's that the initial phase is typically some kind of denial and and that's okay. Like a lot of people still come to me and be like, look, I'm just going to do another X number of rounds and then we'll look at this again. Or, you know, I didn't know this was an option. Maybe it's something I should be thinking about or uh, something else. Or actually I didn't realise maybe we need to take some time to think about it. But there's always this time pressure with fertility. There's a time pressure from your doctor to, to try to get you pregnant as quickly as possible. You want to be pregnant as quickly as possible, That, but Don't let the steam train run away from you because you are driving the steam train. This is your family that you're building, nobody else's. If you need to make a stop at the platform, you need to make a stop. That's just how it goes. And you need to say, hey, I need some time to think about this. Can I get back to you when I'm ready? You don't need to jump right into the next step right away. There's this idea that every month is a month lost and da-da-da-da-da. But the reality of the situation is it's like, one to three months of, of time is reproductively for most people is not going to be do or die in like most circumstances. And I know there's always going to be the camp of people that are like, my AMH is really low. Well, I was, yeah, but you don't know the rate at which it's declining. <laughs> Nobody can tell you that. So it could have been low for the last 10 years and you've had no idea. <laughs> and so I just say to people like, you're in control. Like if you need to get off the train for a second and think, and breathe and grieve and research and connect with new people, do it. Yes. I mean, 100%. And I would say it's really interesting. I mean, I felt the same time pressure. I felt the same, like, it has to be this way, or I have to do it this way, or it has to be in this time. But going back to what you said about the mindset piece is sometimes you just need the space to get to the mindset, or you need the space for your partner to catch up with you. And that's okay, right? It's not none of the time, in my opinion, is wasted. All of the time is being used for 
different aspects of your fertility journey and that it sometimes you're in the, I'm doing all these cycles, right? And sometimes you're spending time focusing on your nutrition and getting move, more movement in your body. And those are important things too. And sometimes you're spending more time in your journal or working with a mindset coach or someone like that to really help you feel mentally prepared. It's about your whole self and taking the time to pause, taking the time to feel the feelings and taking the time to remember that your feelings aren't always facts, that your feelings are your feelings and they're trying to protect you and they're trying to help you. But that sometimes you have to say like, I feel like my doctor doesn't believe in me. But that's not the fact. The fact isn't my doctor doesn't believe in me. The fact is my doctor is doing what I would expect them to do and thinking three steps ahead and is making this comment. But what a gift to get that comment so that I can start saying, I'm not doing that. That's out. Or come to you guys and go, this is what my doctor's saying. Like, help me do what I need to do to make the changes I need to make. Or come to me and go, like, oh my gosh, like, this isn't for me, I can't do this or whatever, and work through those things. And that you may need time to get there. And that's okay. It's okay to pause. And it's okay. And like you said, when you've been doing this for two, three years, four years, however many years you've been doing it, a couple months isn't going to make, it's not going to make or break it. In all honesty, those couple months are probably going to actually get you there faster you can slow down to speed up by doing that work. So absolutely. I'm so glad we had that conversation because I think that's a nugget for everybody. Totally. Yeah. Whether it's donor or not. (laughs) Whether it's donor or not, that's that's just a nugget for anyone who's on the fertility train. (laughs) If we go back to that metaphor. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We've talked about some of the barriers that people, individuals and couples face when it comes to making that next step into donor conception. But are there any that we haven't touched on that you commonly see, Maida? I mean, I think the one that we probably haven't really touched on and can be really personal and hard is like when donor conception doesn't necessarily align with your, the culture that you live in or the religion that you practice or believe in and how you navigate those feelings. And that sometimes, and I think it's important to know this, sometimes you might say, you know what, donor's not the right choice for me because what I believe or because I live in a culture where donor conception is not accepted and I'm not willing to move out of that culture because this is who I am at my core and that that's okay too. But those are all pieces of the puzzle that you have to consider when you are trying to decide if this is the right path for you. And so I think all the things we've talked about, but then also some of those other pieces that can be very deeply rooted and that donor isn't the right path for everyone. It's not the best decision for everyone. And that it's just one of the many options and paths to becoming a parent. Yeah, I think that cultural, religious element has been something I have definitely seen be a big barrier. And even within a partnership, that can contribute to some of that lag and getting to a next step, for example, and that time. can it's can, I've, I've seen it take, you know, a year sometimes. Yes. For people to get yes. on the same page. Mm. Yep. And I think too, sometimes people don't always get on the same page and then there are, then there's more decisions to make. So I just think it's using a donor is a big decision. It's a life changing decision. If you're doing it with a partner, you and your partner both have to be on the same page. It's not okay for one person to say, well, you're the one losing your genetics. So you decide and I'll just go along with you. It's a partnership. It's a decision that you make together. Or if you're doing it by yourself, it's a decision that you are making by yourself and you need to be really comfortable with before you can go forward and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Is there something that people, I mean, we briefly talked about, you know, the little things that pop up in parenthood that you may not have expected along the way, but then the question becomes, oh, is this donor related or not? But is there something that people forget or like don't think of that that you've navigated yourself or you've seen other people navigate that 
is kind of just like a heads up because I think it's those unexpected bits that create a lot of anxiety for people. And like we said, that's just part of life and you just got to be aware aware that there's going to be heaps of unknowns and you just have to accept some of those and move through that. But yeah, I guess I was curious to hear from you and your experiences. I think the biggest one is being comfortable with the idea of using a donor and working through the grief and the loss and the shame that comes with having to not use your own genetics. And that takes a lot of time, energy, effort, and work to get over that. Because like we talked about, it's deeply rooted, right? It's this deeply rooted loss. And so for me, the biggest thing has been being comfortable with who I am as my children's mom And knowing that my donor played a huge role in helping my children come here and be my children, and that I'm not threatened by her, but that she is part of our story in a really positive way. And so for a long time, I was really scared to tell my kids that they were donor conceived. I would tell them, but it was really hard for me. I would cry. I would like feel it deep down in my bones. It was really hard for me to hear people say, oh my gosh, the kids look just like Michael. And I would think, well, yeah, because they would never look like me, right? And so I had to do a lot of mental work of working through my loss, working through my grief, working through my confidence as a mom and as their parent to become comfortable with the idea that three people helped create my family, that it was me, Michael, and the donor, and that all three of us play a very significant and important role in the life of my children. And this came to a very interesting experience that I had recently. So my kids are six and a half now. And so we've told them from the very beginning, their donor conceived, we talked to them about it for a long time, you know, in one ear out the other, like we would read a book and I'd be like, what questions do you have? And they'd be like, I want to read the unicorn book, right? Like it was just very normal. It's been a very normal conversation. Yeah, it's very normal. But my daughter and I were driving home from school the other day. And one of my daughters said to me, mom, did you know that I have two moms? And my initial like gut reaction was, you don't have two moms. What are you talking about? Like, no, 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 no. You don't have two moms. Like I'm your mom. You know, that was everything that went through my head in that moment. But because of all of this work that I've done on myself and the work that I do with my clients, you know, all of these things, I took a deep breath and I said, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And she said, Well, I have two moms. I have the mom who gave you guys her egg so that I could be born. And then I have you, my real mom, my mom who's around, my mom who loves me, my mom who takes care of me. And in that moment, I thought two things. One, yes, I am your real mom because I'm the one who nurtured you, cared for you, get up with you at night, love you, feed you, all of these things. But two... My daughter is, that is a very normal way for a six and a half year old to process the idea of a donor egg as two moms. And for me to affirm that in her is something that I've been working on for seven years because I want her to know that she was donor conceived. I want her to know that that is a special part of who she is and a unique part of who she is. That is a conversation I had been dreading since I thinking about using a donor, but it was such a profound conversation because we have done all of this work to get to this point. And for her to be proud of that fact, for it not to be something that we're ashamed of, to not be something that is taboo or not talked about or isn't okay or appropriate, all of those things. It was a really beautiful moment. And then literally the next thing she said out of her mouth was like something about how someone made some mean comment to her at the lunchroom, right? Like it, because we make it so normal, it's just part of her normal processing as a six and a half year old. And I think like the thing for me is when 
I'm working with my clients, when I'm talking to people who are considering using a donor, when I'm thinking about it with them, in those moments, when you're at the beginning of this journey, it feels like donor conception is going to be the only thing that you think about when you see your kids. It's going to be the only thing, it's going to overshadow all of the other pieces. But when you do the work, when you process your feelings, when you get to a point where you're confident that you can handle anything that's going to come your way, donor conception becomes part of your story, but it's not your whole life. It's not. And someone said to me once, like, I see your Instagram and I listen to your podcast and I hear you talk and I think you just think about using a donor all the time. And the reality is, is that, yes, I think about using a donor a lot because this is what I do for my job, right? Like I'm in this every day, but in the everyday mundane moments of being a mom and being a parent and the getting up in the middle of the night and getting their school lunches packed and all of these things that come with being a parent, I never think about it. I don't yeah. think about it anymore Yeah, because these are my children. I see myself in them. And I'm their mom mm -hmm. and there's no one else. Yeah. I'm it. I'm their mom. Yeah. And so it does become less an everyday thing and it becomes more of a beautiful part of their creation story. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's slightly different, but I, I can sense a theme for many other podcasts I've listened to and even just, you know, people saying, oh, you know, do we tell our child that they were conceived by IVF and you know how will that make them feel and all these kinds of things and you know in the moments when you're doing IVF or in the moments when you're contemplating a donor or in those moments where something comes up you think about it but in the once you're there I don't know you file it into it's like why people do childbirth multiple times you file it away and you kind of forget about it a little bit the memory gets a little bit you know, faded and you go, okay, yep, yeah, that's, that's there. Like I know I had a 20, my mum will say, oh yeah, I had a 24 hour labor with you. She knows that. But like, it doesn't, she doesn't think about that every day looking at me, you know, like it just, I think a podcast I listen to with one of my favorite obstetricians, he always says, you know, at your child's 21st birthday, what are you going to have in your mind? All the memories of you raising them and taking them to school for the first time and all their little things that they do, that's what you're going to be thinking about. And I think that that gives you so much perspective and zooming out, you know, that zoom out effect can, can make such a difference. Absolutely. Now, switching gears slightly to wrap up, what if someone's listening to this and goes, actually, I think I would like to become a donor. What should they do? So I think it depends on where you are in the world. But I think if you're thinking about becoming a donor, amazing. What a gift. I think it's important to think about why. Why do you want to be a donor? And it's important to think about some of the things that we as recipient parents have to think about. Because if you do become a donor, your genetics are going to be out there in the world, right? You are going to, there will be hopefully children created using your genetics. So if you don't have your family yet, you need to know like there will be half siblings out there if you decide to have children in the future and you will want to know how do I talk about this with my children, right? And how do I navigate this with my future relationship and, and the rest of my family? I did a really great podcast episode with an egg donor on my own podcast. My podcast is called Infertility Crossroads, where she talks about the egg donor process and her decision to become an egg donor and why she decided to become an egg donor. And she's actually donated six times now, and that's the maximum number of times. So I think that's a great episode to listen to if you're considering becoming an egg donor. And then I think it's just reaching out to different clinics or different banks or different things and just asking questions and pursuing, you know, seeing what the process looks like for them, if you're willing to do those things. And then I think if you really are considering it and you know of someone in your family who may be considering this option or a friend, you could offer to be a donor to them. I think it's important, though, to really know that, know what their story is and know that this might be an option for them. Because a lot of times people who are struggling to have a baby, 
if people say to them like, oh, I can be your egg donor, like that can be taken offensively. And so you want to make sure you really know, like they've said like, hey, our doctor said we might have to use a donor that you could approach them in that way too. Yeah. In Australia, the best way to do it from my understanding is to yeah, approach a clinic, a fertility clinic, because most fertility clinics do fertility clinic recruited donors. So yeah. And it's like we said, it's altruistic, but the clinic usually covers all the costs of your medication, your treatment, your parking and all those kinds of things. Those little things that people don't think about, but they're all costs <laughs> in fertility treatment yeah. world. So yeah, absolutely. So, and yeah, what an awesome thing to do as well. Maida, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your wisdom and expertise. Now, I would love for you to shout out where people can connect with you so that we'll leave them all in the show notes as well. But maybe if you can give us your your links, as they say. Yes. So the best way to find me is on Instagram. It's at Maida Getman, M-E-T-A-G-E-T-M-A-N. And also on my website, which is metagetman.com. I've got a really awesome free resource out there called My Doctor Just Said Donor, What Do I Do Now? So if you are facing that, grab a copy of that. You'll be on my email list and I send out emails to folks, but would love to have you come say hi. I respond to all of my DMs. I respond to all my comments on my Instagram. I love connecting with others. So I would love to see you there. Incredible. Thank you so much, Maida. We are so appreciative of your time and your wisdom and sharing your experiences. And I know so many of our listeners are going to find this so beneficial. And even just people in the wider community that are searching Google about donor (laughs) conception and stumbling across this. So thank you so much. Yes. Thanks for having me. I had a blast. My pleasure. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope this episode was useful for you on your path. Just so you know, from a nutritional perspective, we still work with people who are using donors. So, for example, reciprocal IVF, single mums by choice, and even those using donor eggs to help prepare their body for pregnancy. So just know nutrition is still super relevant here. Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Hit follow on whatever podcast streaming platform you are listening on and share this episode with someone who you think might like to hear it. And don't forget, if you are on your preconception path, you can download our free preconception lifestyle checklist. It's a simple one-pager that covers some of the basics that you need to be doing everybody needs to be doing to prepare themselves for a healthy pregnancy. Until next episode, everyone. Bye. Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast, acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognises the continuing connections to lands, waters and community. We pay our respects to First Nation cultures and to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations people tuning in today. This podcast is recorded on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation.